Hello, James, and welcome to Cinema Life and Everything. How are you doing today? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. We're just talking about bombing runs. I, w- I will mention that quickly today. It probably won't happen now, and I'm just going to sound like a madman, but if any um, low-flying aircraft are picked up in the back of this recording, it's simply because there's a 1940s festival going on where I am recording from this weekend, and they're just doing low-flying Dan Buster-style aircraft. <laughs> so it, yeah. sounds a bit, it sounds a bit insane around here, but... Yeah, so what what about your way? This is, our, I think, my first sort of trans- uh, transatlantic uh, podcast that I've done so far because you're overseas yeah, well, at the moment. Yeah, to add to that, um, on my end, if you hear any thunderstorms or lightning cracks and things like that, that's that's what's going on, on my end. We're, we're, we're due a big storm that's going to be coming over um, tonight. It's it's 8 p.m. my time, well, tw- quarter past eight my time. What, what, is it, what time is it where you are? Uh, quarter, quarter past one. one, a little bit earlier for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I really appreciate yeah. you making the time for this today as well. Really means a lot, mate. No worries at all. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so Singapore. I'm in Singapore at the moment. Um, yeah, just having a good time with it. Um, is, your, uh, is your screen um, working all right? Yeah, so I, I don't think my camera's as good as yours, so it's always going to be a little bit blurry. Yours is super sharp. You're going to look a lot more uh, camera ready than me, mate. <laughs> it's just a little, yeah. it's it's a little bit, yeah, not 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 a strong resolution. It's the front facing camera, but yours is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, all I'm saying <laughs> is some, something blue is what I'm saying. Oh, okay, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, it's it's, yeah. it's 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 de- it's definitely recording my end. I don't know why that wouldn't be. Uh, going on well as long as you can hear my voice that's the most important thing i guess yeah. but yeah I, I can i can i can see a picture but yours is super sharp it's a lovely lovely definition uh camera there but um, can you see um on my t-shirt oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i can see the future <laughs> <laughs> But before we go any further, like I say, for the people watching on YouTube and the people listening on the podcast, would you like to just tell everyone a little bit about yourself? And this is always a tough one. It's like your whole life go, but <laughs> just like yeah. a bit of a background on yourself. Um, so I'm a, I'm a performer, uh, primarily at the moment um, doing stunt work. Uh, I'm an actor. Um, in the past, I did uh, musical theatre. I, I was a professional vocalist for a number of years, and then I dived straight into um stunt work did a flip 180 in my career and um headed out to japan i was in japan for two years doing a stunt show and then i went out to i went out to singapore um to do another stunt show called water world um covid happened and then we went out to beijing to help open that same stunt show in the brand new universal studios um out in beijing which was an awesome experience to be the you know an inaugural cast uh, out in Beijing and, and kind of like set the standard out there and, and teach others how to do it. I was a stunt trainer out there, um, and then I came back to London for a year and I was working in TV and film in London, um, and that's where I met I met you, mate. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah and um, we uh, we became friends and uh, I got asked to come out to Singapore to reopen this show and I'm currently in rehearsals right now. Um, reopening uh, the same Waterworld stunt show uh, that was closed down due to COVID, and now it's, it's opening back up. So here I am, to open up a new show. It's, it's a water-based stunt show, is what I'm do- doing currently. So we have, it's nothing to do with animals or anything like that. We work with um, the only animals, <laughs> other 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 cast members. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Allegedly, um, is that based on the Kevin Costner film? Yeah, yeah. Nice, I love that film. That, I'm hoping yeah. someone will select that as one of their film chases one day because I, well, I love thinking about that film. I, I debated, I debated uh, <laughs> getting into it because obviously I know this, I know the film very, very well. Uh, yeah, but I just, it's too close to home. I, I live and breathe it at the moment. I see, <laughs> see you, are, you are water world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the show is is uh, the, the live action show is li- literally following on from the end of the film. Um, yeah, so uh, the Helen character comes back to the original atoll, um, meets up with Sage and um, expresses, you know, there's dry land, it's not a myth, da da da. Um, and then the smokers, you know, like uh, the, yeah. the, the, the deacon, and, you know, uh, they come back and we, you know, there's a big fight, and then the mariner comes back on his jet ski and, you know, beats everyone up, and it's a, it's a great show. There's jet skis, water skis, um, incredible. boats flying about, yeah, there's, there's pyrotechnics, there's flames. Um, High falls, um, all sorts of things. Yeah, great, great fight scenes as well. I would love to ask you quickly before we get into the film choices. What was 
Uh, where I mean, there might not be a connection, but what was your curiosity following from like musical theatre into stunts? Where what what sort of leapt out of you? Was it was it anything in particular that you can put your finger on where you were like, okay, I want to give this a go now? Or I, I actually never really felt all that comfortable in musical theatre. Mm. Um, it never really felt like um, my my thing. I felt mm. like I was a bit of a a round peg in a square hole. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not, I had some great contracts. I loved it. You know, there was uh, there, there was some very fulfilling things. I, um, uh, I I managed to achieve a, a fair amount when I was when I was doing it, but I was never really particularly happy. And maybe like the the atmosphere um, with with the types of people I was working with, you know, uh, it it kind of it got a bit draining. The drama mm. and the complaining and kind of like you know, it didn't seem like there was like a a whole lot left there for me to do yeah so I started looking at what I was good at and I've always been extremely active and athletic and um into sports and trampolining and and you know ev- everything that's active and outdoorsy I, I loved and I just kind of like did a I did a stunt course uh in in London enjoyed mm. it loved it and then I auditioned for a stunt show out in Japan and lo and behold I got it you know I just I got <sighs> I got the gig and then went out to Japan and never looked back, really. Uh, and within those two years, within those two years out in Japan, <clears> I, it was a fairly simple stunt show. It was a uh, Terminator uh, at oh, right. Studios. Um, and I played the Terminator. Oh, wow. It was, it was, it was a very, it, it sounds fun, but it was a very, very simple show. Mm. Uh, it wasn't very stunts heavy. Um, but it was a, it was a gateway. It kind of like gave you awareness, like safety awareness, which is obviously, as you know, the, the biggest, you know, yeah. denominator in stunts. And it, kind of, it gave me like a really good grounding. Um, ended up being show captain at the end of the year for the first year. By the end of the second year, I was uh, I was a creative director for, for the wow. venue. Um, and then I moved on and went into Waterworld, and that's a much, much bigger venue, much more, you know, moving parts and way more things to learn. So it was almost like going back to college. So... Uh, I, I went to college. I went to performing arts college and mm. musical theatre and acting, and it felt like going back again. And you know, but getting paid for it rather than you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my gosh. laughs> yeah. And I, I guess that that's a lovely sort of look into life and a great attitude you have as well. That you never truly stop learning. That there's always something more to pick up on. And it's great if you can get into those situations where obviously yeah, it's becoming a job and you're getting paid for it and you're learning at the same time, but always being open to um, accept that knowledge as well. Mm, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate for that. I, if, if I'm, if I'm feeling safe and secure and I, I know what I'm doing in my role, then I, I know that I'm not being stretched or pushed or anything like that. And it doesn't feel right with me. I'm, I'm much more comfortable being uncomfortable now because I've spent mm. so many years um, you know, treading water in, in deep, you know, deep situations where I, I was out of my depth and I had to learn quickly. And so now that's one of my strengths, you know, um, there's, it doesn't intimidate me. It doesn't intimidate me learning something new, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's more exciting. You know, it, it kind of confuses me when people go, Oh, I, I've not done that before. I don't think I'll try. And I'm like, why? You know, it's, it's an opportunity to grow and better yourself. Do you, do you ever find something like, I, I can only just give a quick example myself, where I've been uh, on the uh, British Action Academy course, and they teach all oh, the yeah. weapons, and one of them is uh, the cutlass, and I was having a real hard time with it, but that's the one I'm interested in the most, most now, because it's giving me the most difficulty. Do you like that yeah. idea of what you're saying, seeking, seeking discomfort, but pushing yourself out there, and the bits that don't come easy once upon a time maybe people sway away from them i would probably because oh it's too much it's gonna it's too complicated but then it's actually something i walk, work towards now because it's you're like you say you're challenging yourself and this is going to be the biggest the biggest accomplishment if you do get proficient at it yeah exactly i mean for a small example uh that's a great example of, that you said about the cutlass um, mm. uh, an example that i went through just today um, I'm putting myself through uh, a race uh, in October, the High Rocks race, which is like essentially um, a total of eight, eight kilometer runs um, cut up into eight sections. So if you do a kilometer run, you do an obstacle. You do a kilometer run, Oof. and you do another, another, and you keep on going. You do you do eight um, exercises within these one kilometer runs, and it's grueling. Um, and it's not my style of training at all. My, no, you know, 
previously I've done more strongman style, kind of like functional strength fitness is, is kind of where my bread and butter is. Mm. Um, and this, this is like pure cardio. Uh, my girlfriend, who I'm doing it with, she's an absolute uh, beast at it. She's incredible. Um, and we went through um, like a physical fitness training this morning. We went to a, um, a branch where they're, they're endorsing it and we, we went through it. And it was like it wasn't a full it wasn't a full race. It was like a just under half of what you had to do. Yeah. Um, and just getting through it, I was like, ah, oh, this is this is an uphill battle. But it, <sighs> it felt good to be out of my comfort zone again. Yes. Um, yeah. But again, I've I've got something to work towards now. I've got like a, a time, and I'm I've got like a. Do, do you know what I mean? Like it, it, yeah. it doesn't feel like it feels like good. It feels like oh, I can see some progression in in the future with this. I, 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 yeah, I, I, ju- I just think that's it. It's having a target, having a goal. And it's it's nice to go after the long, uh, low-hanging fruit every now and again. It's nice to give yourself some more wins because it gets you motivated. But then it's good, like as you've just been saying there, to get comfortable with discomfort, long-term gain, a- and pushing yourself over the long term to get, because those bigger achievements feel even better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amazing. And then, you know, it, it just... It, it, you have a bigger wheelhouse, you know, you yes. have more to offer. You know what I mean? It just makes sense. And do you find as well that if you're like, sometimes the, the path isn't obvious, but the more things you become experienced in, it may not be an obvious connection, but then uh, like, I, I don't know, for instance, from me doing years of wrestling, suddenly when I'm learning the footwork for the cutlass, it's the same as doing a shot in wrestling so the way the footwork is so sometimes there's some weird there's some weird parallels like i don't know with singing your breath work and then when you're doing a stunt when to release your diaphragm and stuff as well so you don't get winded there's some weird crossover cross-sectional learning that doesn't always become immediately apparent yeah i mean it, it, yeah the, uh, it's it's um absolutely it, it talking of talking of the the singing thing you know like you yeah. you'll have a day on set and all you've been doing is like shouting and screaming and uh you know reacting to punches and going oh, ah, like that mm. everyone else has, has a hoarse voice by the end of it uh but with with breath control and working with your vocals you you learn how to make those same sounds but um not strain your voice and it's just little yes. things like that um and choreography as well you know coming from a, a singing mm. dancing background it's, it's easy for me to pick up choreography because you have a body awareness i'm yes. six foot five i'm six foot five and like 107 kilograms I'm, i shouldn't i shouldn't really move this well you know? <laughs> no, <I'm all> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean but i've got like dance training and and that helps me kind of like be more fluid uh with my movements it's called transferable skills yeah um and you know you can you can learn and adapt to so many more situations if you increase and open up your circle of transferable skills you know i just i I just on a quick aside i just have to mention um me and james did a uh a a day sort of um oh what was it sort of like a demonstration of skills for take free and um there was this bit there was this bit at the end where it's like you know just just ad lib just do what you want which is always like horror for me because I'm like what do I do and I hate then, it I hate it <laughs> but then James <laughs> just sort of like stood, stood in front of the camera and as he said at six foot five 107 uh kilos it's just started like breaking off front flips and nip ups <laughs> and I'm like oh wow <laughs> I, I was like I can't do any of that <laughs> no, but, it, but it was super impressive to watch like you say that that deceptively like fluid movement and stuff but it's, it's amazing to watch it's just like christ that you can you've got some shift in you for that size of a frame as well it's always impressive to see yeah yeah and, yeah. and as long as i can keep doing that I'll, I'll you know keep on increasing that sort of uh capability for sure I, it comes it comes from my stubbornness honestly because i i've got this <laughs> thing i've got this thing where uh in especially in my musical theater path and it kind of like carried on through to my st- stunt training as well um, people will obviously pigeonhole you. They'll, they'll typecast yes. you, and they'll be like, "Oh, that guy's six foot five. He can't do any of that stuff." Um, and so, sorry, I had an alarm going off there. That's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's my stubbornness to be like, "Well, no, I, I'm more than capable of doing everything that that you know five foot seven guy can do." Um, and so I tend to prove it, and it, it's still now. Like it, it's still something I do now, uh, and it's one of those things where I don't want to 
have a an excuse, you know, for for not being able to do something. I don't want to be like, oh, I can't do that because you know I'm six five. I want to be able to be like, no, I'm I I can do that even though I'm six five, and I can do it just as well as any anybody else who is much shorter than me. So when people be like, oh, you know, you're you're taller here, you're longer, so this is going to be more difficult for you, and I go. No, it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that that's awesome as well. Like you say, not accepting limitations and being that uncommon amongst un- uncommon people because you believe in yourself that you can do it. And that that self belief is the biggest driver of any sort of success. Really, you, to have that mm-hmm. self knowledge that yeah, I, I I will find some way of being capable of doing this. Right, let's get onto some films then. <laughs> yeah. So you you actually set a nice little boundary for yourself here that you wanted to go after films that were very meaningful when you were young, and you then selected three absolute bangers, two of which I've not seen in quite some time, and yeah. loved getting back to them, especially singing along to Going the Distance and completely forgetting how good James Woods was in one of these. Oh my films. God. Like, bloody crazy. hell. He's incredible, <laughs> right? What an amazing film. But um, so yes, would you like to say your three films and then we can pick the first one to go with? Yes. So um the first one is Hook. Brilliant. Uh the second one is uh Disney's Hercules amazing. the Renaissance period. And the last one is Back to the Future. Incredible. And where would you like to start, mate? Let's let's get back to the future out of the way. I think that's uh that's my least favorite out of the three, but it's, right. still, it's still an absolute banger. I, I do, I do love Back to the Future, but it doesn't have that same kind of like place in my heart as mm. the other two do. I, I, I just the thing I got about watching this again. It always reminds me, but just the um, how that script would never get through Hollywood. No, oh, oh my god, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like a, a kid goes back in time and starts necking on with his mum. Like what yeah. The hell? <laughs> Don't don't sleep with your mum as a hero's journey. I was like, what am I watching? It's bizarre, isn't it? But when, when this is kind of like the theme that uh, that I, I'll, I'll kind of want to like uh, loosely, you know, um, have a linear kind of, kind of direction through these films. Mm. Um, the thing that when you're a kid in the '90s, for me in the '90s, I, I was a kid, and you just kind of accept these storylines, and they just kind of wash over yeah. you, and they don't really. They don't really connect as as what we do now. We have a different sensibility, don't we, in today's society? Yeah. And so, seeing those storylines, and actually, and seeing those same movies that you uh, grew up with and adored and like have a special connection to, and then just seeing them through an adult's eyes yes. from today's standard, it's so kind of jarring. And and you know, you can say that with a lot of like classic, classic things, but especially the kids' movies, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah no i completely agree completely agree but so yeah. so yeah but what i mean there's 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 so much good there's so much subtext going on in back to the future i mean mm-hmm. why 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 is this one resonated with you so much over the years this is one of those ones that was always there i i don't mm. i don't remember the first time i saw it. it it's one of those ones where it's that comfort thing you just mm. go back to it and it's just that that good feeling you know like it's just uh, a great story it's like it's got that pace it's got that excitement it's got that fan uh, that uh, fantasticalness about it and you just kind of like sit back and you just let it wash over you um i just i love i love martin mcfly's uh, yes. energy he's just like the, the charisma the effortless charisma that this guy has um obviously michael j fox you know, mm. um it's just it's that un, untangible thing that he has and he, he has that it factor and yes. watching it and like wondering why this guy is so magnetic to watch he's not doing anything particularly you know grandiose or incredible it, his his choices and like his affectations and they're just so uh you're, you're rooting for him you know you want to mm. be you want to be his friend you want to be that guy that you know you want to maybe even want to be him you know it was it was so interesting for me watching it back. Actually, I had ended up I ended up watching this even before you suggested it as one of your three film choices because I'd gone to see The Flash and they reference Back to the yes. Future quite a lot in it. So I ended yeah. up coming home and watching it. And my edition of it has got some of the scenes that the original Martin McFly, Eric Saltz, was in yeah. it. And you watch the way he plays it very, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Again, he's just playing it very straight, very yeah. dealing with the weight of what he's doing. And mm. 
it, like you say, how Ma uh, Michael J. Fox plays with that lightness of touch, it's a different interpretation, but one that is just it. It what you can see how one way was going to be uh, uh, a film that was going to do well, but Michael J. Fox's portrayal was going to be the blockbuster of the summer. He was just bringing yeah. his energy to it, and it changed the feel of the film completely. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't around in the eighties, but to me. Michael J. Fox and, and Back to the Future in general is just this kind of like the epitome of what I feel the 80s is. Mm. And, and that, that, that undeniable feeling of, you know, like, oh, this is like what it must have been like. You know, there's, I, I don't know, there's, it's just like a, if you could kind of like spin a genre into one film, it would be that. Yes. Even though they spent half the movie in the 50s. Um, it's a, a 1980s guy reacting to how things were, you know, 30 years previous. Um, and I think it's I think that's what makes it so iconic because Michael J. Fox managed to man, manages to encapsulate an entire decade, an entire you know era mm. with his performance almost you know. Do, do you think so? It's something to do like in a lot of films now as well. For a children's film, it deals with a lot. It, like you say, it deals with the nature of existence, um, the choices you make, how it affects the rest of your life. It deals with yeah. death quite a lot as well. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, see, seeing, um, spoilers here, but seeing, you know, Doc Brown get a machine gun very early on. Um, <laughs> it, it, for a kid's film, it, it, it really does go there. Um, and looking at, I mean, there are still some really affecting kids' films now, but do, do you think that was something to do with it there, that it, it does have really strong stakes and is quite bold with its choice and isn't afraid to go there and make some big, strong observations for children to sort of understand? Yeah, I, th I think that's... And also because it, it comes across as well as such a simplistic story, uh, mm. in, in its lightness, in its lightness. But when you actually really go back and look at it, the amount, the attention to detail that yes. they have, like all of the little Easter eggs that are like littered through the film, it's just the, the you know, the layers upon layers upon layers of um, thought and real kind of like execution. I don't, I just don't think you get as much today. Mm. It feels like, it feels like a, a real kind of like artist has just like chipped away yes. at the marble and made sure that everything was right before they, they put it into, into action. Which they just don't do now, you know. Like you have like rewrites as the film is being yeah filmed these days, and it just you can just tell it just feels, you know, that's what makes it timeless, you know. I think the other one that always blows me away as way as well is that Michael J. Fox to be allowed to be on set was having to film his TV show Family Ties at the same time, and <coughs> I, I recently saw his um um. Still, st oh, I forget what it's called, Still a Fox thing, but it's his, his documentary about Michael J. Fox. And he was filming Back to the Future and doing Family Ties, basically doing it on like one to two hours sleep a night, which considering yeah. he's getting that performance, I d <sighs> amazing. And also probably a lot of coffee. I think, I think, yeah, as well. Like they, they made him like a, a bed trailer that he would go into. There was a small bed that he would sleep on and that would like uh, save the time for him to go from one studio to the other and however long that would take, he would be sleeping in that time <laughs> to get Man. to Unreal, right? Like, that's that's dedication. And yeah. like, looking back, maybe you can tell some shots where he's like looking a little bit bleary-eyed. <laughs> you know, it just adds to it. Incredible. No, and, and like I said, I, I think... What you said there was about chipping away at it, but there's just the the eye the iconography, like the way Mike McFly is dressed, the choice of music, the DeLorean for Christ's sake, which is an absolutely <coughs> incredible choice, and it and, and even things like the flux capacitor, it's explained, it's not over explained, but just yeah. enough to make it iconic. So anybody you can quote a line from that film, and people immediately well, know. <laughs> Everyone knows it. Great yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, an, an amazing choice and, and an incredible film. And actually, I uh, sadly, people, I, I don't know, it's not disappearing, but there's been a few times I've sort of mentioned it and people said they haven't seen it. And I think it's one that if you haven't seen it, go and check it out because I, I'm really glad it's one of those ones that did look primed for a reboot or reimagining. And I'm, I'm really glad they haven't done that. No, I've, I've heard that there's a rumour that... Robert Downey Jr. and Tom Holland are going to be eyeing up doing a part four, which I oh I, no, I don't want that at all. Nah. Where it is. 
Yeah, it's it's that that that's the thing. I really after seeing a few films recently where they, they've added another not notch into the franchise, I'm like, okay, you want IPs that are good, but some Iggy Pop has this amazing quote where he says, Sometimes the best time about being a, in a party is knowing when to leave. And I think yeah. with some of the, some of these like uh, properties, they do just need to go, that's the ending that it needed and stop it there. Yeah. Oh, no. uh, Hollywood doesn't think like that these days. They just want to be like, how, how much money can we squeeze out yeah. of this franchise? doesn't matter if it ruins it, you know? Um, yeah. <sighs> I, I, well, they, when, and they actually went on to uh, have the sequels as well. Like I, I've seen yeah. the sequels less, less often than I've seen back to the future, but they're still great. Yes. Um, and it's funny how the, the guy who plays, um, uh, George McFly, uh, what's his oh, name? Crispy, uh, Crispy, Crispy Glover. And Glover. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he didn't like how, how the, um, George's character was, um, was going to be portrayed in the next couple of films. Cause he, yeah. he was like, Oh, I don't want him to be a materialistic, you know, average eighties guy. Like, so he quit. He, he, he didn't want any, anything to do with it. And then he ended up suing the, suing the production for, um, using his likeness without his permission. Oh, was, wow. Yeah. It was, it was loads and loads of backstories. There's so many things, you know, like obviously Michael J. Fox getting it last second and, yeah, There's so many crazy things happening with this with the Back to the Future, which you you know, uh, YouTube is a great um, yes, you know, use for like finding out all these little backstories. <laughs> I, I drive my girlfriend crazy with like random facts <laughs> and knowledge because how do you know this crap? Like, what, oh, what I'm, I'm I'm exactly the same. And one thing that isn't so popular now, which I love, and I still get for DVDs when you get the directors and actors commentaries because they usually it's like watching it again. It's like watching it in a cinema with someone talking over the top of it, but the person talking over the top of it is actually really interesting yeah. and added loads of lots of insider knowledge. Um, yeah, but the, the ones for Back to the Future, like you say, it's some of these most iconic films, it's, you read that everything is against it. Sleep deprived, um, sleep deprived cast, uh, a script that went, tried to get through the system like eight to 12 times and they kept rejecting it. They said it was never gonna, it wasn't a good film. It needed rewrites and stuff and all these things against it. And yet yeah. that comes out of it, the, the, you know, the budget being reduced while it was ongoing and yet it made it through and we're still talking about it today. So it's taking those chances on those movies as well that don't necessarily seem that they're gonna be iconic, but yet for whatever reason they do, they just hit the point where they need to be out. Yeah, and it's that fine line, isn't it? It could have, it could have gone either way with that story. It could have yeah. been a massive flop, but there was something about it. Everything, you know. I love also mention of of uh, you know, Doc uh, Doc Brown, uh, yeah, Christopher Lloyd. I just love the fact that that guy has been eighty, looking <laughs> eighty years old since, since the mid eighties. Like this guy, what makes it so hilarious is like he has like like a bit of prosthetic makeup in the eighties scenes. And yeah, you go back to the 15 scenes, the 50 scenes, and the, the the prosthetics are gone. But it's so he looks exactly the same. Say, yeah. The exact same. This guy's been old for like you know the last 50 years. It's crazy, but he's I, incredible as well. He's amazing. I think the only time I've ever sort of seen, you know, I don't. I'd have to look up to see how old he was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But even then, he looks like he's like getting on a bit. You know, it's like yeah. it's got what, one of these old. A, faces. Wasn't he in um, the first thing he was in? Was in a. a, a like a, a taxi cab. Uh, it was with uh, Danny DeVito as well, funny enough, who's in the Hercules oh, films. Yeah. That, that was his first thing. And he was in his mid to late 20s at that point. And I can't remember the name of the of the sitcom, but it was like a, you know, a 70s sitcom. And he was like in his early 30s, late 20s, I guess, when he did that. And again, he still, was, you know, had the, you know, the receding hairline, but his hair was brown, still wild and everything. But he looked like he was in his 50s then. I don't know. <laughs> I guess that back in those days, they just lived off of, uh, you know, brown liquor and cigarettes. And yeah. <laughs> He's poor, poor, poor Christopher Lloyd has seen things. <laughs> yeah. Can't be unseen. Yeah. So, where, so where would you like to go next? We have the amazing Hook or Hercules. Let's go with Hook. Oh, wow. Let's go with Hook. Oh, so, man. Robin Williams. Oh. But this one was really, really near and dear to my heart. I, mm -hmm. I, I grew up loving, loving the Hook films, and I yes. just assume I just assumed that everybody else did as well. Um, it was, it was a, 
every time I went over to my grand's house, we would go, you know, go out and visit her and uh, on my mum's side, go out and visit. And she had this, um, you know, a, a, you know, a collection of, of VHS tapes. And there was like a little triple VHS collection that you could just buy as a triple set. Yeah. And it was, it was um, Adam's Family, Ghostbusters. And oh, Hook. wow. That's smashing. Yeah. That history, really. yeah. <laughs> but for whatever reason, uh, I, I love the other two, but they never felt like they were for, for, for me at that age. But Hook was always that thing that resonated with me. And I think because, you know, like Steven Spielberg has this like beautiful whimsicalness of like making, you know, you, you know, your daydreams come to life in, in his films. You know, he's got this like, incredible, adventurous, you know, like just uh, this whimsical way of telling his stories, especially back in the 80s and 90s, yes. you know. Um, and Hook for me was just. I wanted to be in that film, not like, you know, act in that film. I wanted to be there. Okay, the yeah. sets were so tangible. And when you look, when you look at the, when you look at the, um, you know, the behind the scenes features and things like that, they were, they were made, you know, that, like the they big, had, yes. they had hundreds of carpenters working day and night to make these unbelievable, like working livable sets. And, it was just in, incredible. He did the same with the Goonies, you know, like that was the same thing there. Yeah. Um, another great film. Yeah, it's astonishingly good film, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, what, so the, the biggest, I, I assumed literally up until about four years ago, five years ago, where I had this, not argument, but like debate with a co-worker of mine, a fantastic actor by the name of Zach. Um and he was play, he plays the the he, at the time he was playing the bad guy in in our Waterworld show. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, a fantastic actor and a very very generous actor as well. You know, like um, so, someone that you just you look up to because he has he's so knowledgeable, so experienced, and um, has a lot to give and a lot to offer. And so you just you listen to him when he has opinions on film and stuff like that because he's a connoisseur of it. Um, and I overheard him talking talking about Hook. And I kind of, you know, joined the conversation. I was like, yeah, I love Hook. And he goes, oh, Hook's a piece of shit. And oh, like, no. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? And we had this, like, full-blown, like, debate. Oh, it was flying and friendly, but he hated it. He couldn't say, he couldn't, he couldn't think of one good thing uh, what? to say oh, about no, it. No. I was like, What? crazy and then and then I, I i look and the reviews were panned like he, it was a mm. terrible review it, they said that um it was too cheesy it didn't add anything to the peter pan mythos uh you know it uh, uh, they didn't go far enough with it. it it seemed dead for the first you know like act one and act two were, were too like you know he, he didn't become peter pan until the very end of the last 20 minutes which is true uh and it just seemed to be stale for them. And I was like, no, this, like, I don't see it. Because it's, uh, for me, like, Robin Williams held it together so incredibly well. And, like, he's another person that just has this, you know, like, effortless, effortless whimsy about him. Yeah. Um, you know, rest in peace. But, like, he, the, the one, I do remember the one thing at the time when I was a kid that I didn't like. And there were one or two things. Julia Roberts never did it for me gonna, to think about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's just my own personal opinion, but I I never felt like she was really. I, I felt like she was. It was a bit, it was a bit like of a. You could feel that like the energy. She wasn't really there. She wasn't. Really it there. wasn't invested in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of like, yeah. I mean, watching it back, I sort of got that. But again, Robin Williams is actually getting up there with Denzel Washington for me now. Where I watch him in stuff and his range and just his ability to yeah. get every aspect, every emotion. He's because he because he's loud rambunctious comedic style is so he's so known for that sometimes that's all people see in him but in films like this he's so delicate with his performance in parts and shows that real sense of loss and and i think honestly to your point what you said about peter pan only really showing up for the last 20 minutes because that is going to be robin williams being full ball robin williams crazy robin williams so if you have that maybe for an hour and 20 it's gonna underplay everything else that goes before it so i think those last 20 minutes are good and enough of that style of performance so you, the whole film yeah. becomes memorable yeah um 
yeah, exactly. And I, I would agree with that as well. And like, there's this great juxtaposition where you have Peter Panning, the lawyer, who is trying to like uh, fit himself into this never, uh, Neverland world with uh, mm. Rufio, like, oh, like Rufio, Rufio. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so cool. Like, he yeah. was like coolest kid. And then at the end where he like, he's passing over the, you know, passing over the sword, he goes, you can fight, you can fly, and you can, and then Robin Williams goes, you know, does that, ah, like, yeah, the, yeah. The co- the cockerel crow, just, and, that feeling of like you know that that's cheesy. Obviously, like the adults at the time would have been like, oh, ridiculous." But like, I love that. It kind of just yeah. gave me this like energy, you know. And I get uh, that nostalgia now when I see it. You know, I don't feel like, "Oh, it's ridiculous." I love it. I, I think that, and that's why. Again, this sort of for me listening to you, it sort of ties back into your ability and want to. Oh, I can do that. I can attempt to do that. And I, I think that's really what that film is about for me daring to dream with you know believing what wanting wanting to be able to it's not in a way be young again but feeling that the universe is limitless and you are capable of everything and and honestly why not and why shouldn't art portray that why can't you have a journey to get there and but actually finally get your dreams you know I, 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 that's yeah. why i love it as a piece of art i think why can't you be positive it hasn't always got to be dark and dour and and it's good because when you do finally get that release in the last 20 minutes it's like yeah that struggle was worth it he's made it yeah yeah one one scene in particular that always got me and like captured my imagination and made me want to you know just be able to walk around and be in that in that film as like a, a living person the uh the, you know the the, the make believe food. You know? Oh yes, yeah. When they're all having to dream it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, it smells amazing. And then and then he's uh, and then he has like the, the the verbal battle with Rufio. Yes. Um, and then he goes, oh, you know, and then he flicks flicks the spoon at him, and then he sees it, and all of a sudden there's this incredible food, this incredible spread of like you know, just made up food. It wasn't even realistic looking food. Like <laughs> no. ice cream that was blue and blue and pink and there was loads of stuff in there and it looked incredible and the the, the way that um steven spielberg manages to just elevate elevate that kind of that sense of that childhood wonder, and knowing yeah. what kid that that wonder knowing what kids would really kind of like be drawn to is just incredible would you say as well i mean i'm not anti-cgi i think steven spielberg himself in stuff like jurassic park has u- utilized cgi to an incredible degree but yeah. I'm very big on practical effects, as it sounds like you are as well. And for you, is it is it finding that balance? Do you think that cinema and, and art in general has become a little bit too reliant on the CGI? Because I get it to a degree. It's quicker to do. If you've got to do a reshoot, you can just re or reset. You haven't got to, like, set everything down again. You just, like, only have to put the graphics in at the end. But do you think there's a, there's a line to be struck there between practical effects and visual effects? I think uh, the best use of CGI that I've seen is something that elevates something that's already there. For example, yes. uh, Christopher Nolan. Yes. He, he's a, he hates u- using um, special effects unless it's there to add onto what he already has done visually. For one particular example in that, um, in The Dark Knight, where um, there's a huge, huge lorry that gets uh, exploded up yeah, and, and it pins over like that. There's a bolt that like drives up the, the lorry over. And the only thing that is digitally removed with CGI is that bolt and everything else is practical. And that's a great use of CGI, you know, to kind of bolster what you've done with practical effects. What I hate about the CGI is, is the laziness of like, oh, I'll just fix it in post. Like, I guess that we'll do something there. And then expecting these underpaid, overworked CGI artists yes. to just fix ridiculous things that can't be done. And yeah. then you get something like The Flash, where you have, you know, crappy CGI. I love The Flash story. I actually really enjoyed it in the movie, but I, I was taken out of it, and I was like taken out of the, out of the movie and out of the out of the world. And I was looking at crazy bad CGI. Mm. And then I heard the you know the director saying like, oh no, that was on purpose. That's all in his head, and that sounded like a weak excuse to me. Um, I feel like CGI shouldn't be taking you out of a film. It shouldn't be making you be like, oh, this isn't real. The stakes should be there. You know, like the whole point of watching a film is to feel something, to feel the, for the characters and making sure that, you know, the director's job 
is to make sure that the, the audience is feeling what they should be feeling at the right time. And CGI for me, if it's done badly, just takes you out of it because there's yeah. no stakes anymore because your mind is subconsciously telling you everyone's safe because it's clearly fake. And if your mind can tell you it's fake and there's no, yeah. and there's no stakes there, then why should you care? I completely agree and it's sort of like it's always setting the rules of the universe as well I've got games on the PlayStation I've got games on the Super Nintendo and because the graphics are of that level you can still get emotionally involved in playing a video game or looking at old school 80s effects like I don't know say something but this is an amazing choice but something like The Thing where that's all practical effects and now you can see the joins a little bit you can see the latex but it's because it's of its time your mind doesn't question it but when you are looking at today's stuff and you've seen some incredible visual effects and it's just, it can be anything if the performance is off if the music is wrong if the lighting goes a bit weird and like if the cgi is bad suddenly it breaks the universe and you're like you're not in, you're not immersed anymore you're starting to look at the joins and that's the worst thing you can do with a piece of art bring people out of it making them aware that they're just watching a movie yeah and in these like adventure films uh you know namely like Dwayne the Rock Johnson films are really bad for it where he's mortal and, and the Fast and the Furious films I, I've stopped watching those now because <clears throat> there's zero stakes for me because yes. these guys are now superhuman you know nothing can hurt them and like the, the gravity of the things like the, the, the physics don't work yeah. so for me I don't care because there's, there's nothing for me to grab hold of um, and that annoys me in films it feels like a, a cheap uh, get out you know like a, oh I guess we'll just do this and it feels like one of those things, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, there's no meticulousness to it. There's no like there's no artist with a, you know, a chisel making sure that everything is perfect. Before yes. It's being delivered. It's on the day, a flippant change of the script and like, oh, we're doing this now. And it's like, oh, it's fine. We'll just put a green screen behind us and it'll, it'll work. And it just <clears throat> there's no art. There's no craft to it anymore. And it's disappointing. And you're you know, you don't want to pay that money for, for something that is so indispensable, you know, you know, dispensable now. Yeah, yeah, they, and, and exactly like almost like a Frankenstein script where everything has sort of been stitched together last minute. It's a, you you want to, I think it, if you have, like you say, something set in stone, then the cast knows where to go and the director's got his vision. In the edit, you know what you're trying to get. It's, it's a through line from the beginning, from its conception to its end, as opposed to getting halfway through and wanting to switch everything up. Yeah. Um, well, uh, should we uh, jump onto Hercules then, if it, that sounds well, that, weird? But, that, go on. <laughs> that's actually a great segue, because you can't have a cartoon no. without that meticulous planning. They have to storyboard everything. Everything has to be approved. There has to be, you know, um, there has to be production design, like illustrations done and prior to that. And, and nothing can be left to chance because everything is created and fabricated, you know. Um, and... And I want to thank you so much for selecting Hercules because it's been a while since I've watched, and I don't know why, watched the older animated classics. I, I got stuck into the CGI ones for a little while. And mm. straight away in watching this, within the first five minutes, I was blown away by how colourful it was and just... I don't know, it's just so sharp and you could have released this yesterday and all right, it's an older form of animation, but it just is so powerful. It just yeah. instantly hooks you in and you can't look away and it just feels fresh and light and immediately I have a sense of confidence that I'm watching it that they and they know that exactly what they're doing, which I, I'm not really getting with that, apart from maybe Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, I've not seen in a little while, you know? Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's DreamWorks. Puss in Boots is... Uh, a DreamWorks franchise, which maybe is connected to Universal. It's nothing to do mm. with Disney. And like Disney at the moment is just recur regurgitating the same old things and trying to like grab onto that thing that they had in the 90s, that Renaissance era mm. where they had things like Hercules and, and you know, uh, Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and uh, uh, those classic ones, Tarzan and other Yeah, Tarzan. Yeah, Tarzan. I was going to do Tarzan, but I felt like I had to go with Hercules because I've got something to add on to the end of it. Oh, so yeah. we'll, we'll talk about how we could do Tarzan another feel. time. Yes, all right, we'll do Tarzan <laughs> another time. Um, but with Hercules, like that was, you know, the you know if if you're a kid growing up in that era, like I was in the '90s, uh, I don't know how you can't not love Hercules. Yeah. Um, it's just. It's magical, you know, you, you watch and Disney had, Disney was on fire at that point. Everything they released was just perfect. Yeah. Uh, 
and we, you know we were really lucky to I've, I was really lucky to have grown up in that time and, and be able to see that in, in the cinema you know um, and there's no one uh, any any day of the week I could easily you know stick on a, a Disney movie and just kind of like it, it's almost like a comfort you know? yeah you watch it and you're like it's all good you know you're watching something that's you know just brings back that nostalgia and it's just this effortless storytelling again and it's that uh, untangible magic that they just had they had it in a bottle and they you know it's the songs it's the as you say the art style and it's it's the uh, it's just that magical color and it's do you know what i mean it, it's yeah 100 percent. They, they can't do it now it's you know it's different. I'm not saying it's bad. Like I love the Pixar stuff. I think Frozen is good for the. I've I've got nieces and nephews who are of that age now. You got you got Moana. It's mm. really great, but it's not the same. It's not as it's not it's not as good in my opinion. I, I think the biggest one for me was where I watched the uh, was it the rebooted Lion King, and it, there wasn't anything. I mean, the, the visual effects. I mean, Christ, that looked like a real lion in parts, but you watch the old one and it's just like you say the colors and the vividness of it. And it just, it just works. It feels seamless. And it, it's weird. It felt the original felt less yeah. dated than the CGI. I can see in about 10 years time, people watch the CGI one and be less engaged with that than they will with the cartoon version. And it's the same it's with Hercules. It's not going to stand the test of time at all. No, it's strange. Yeah. It's really, it's really, really strange. But yeah, I, I don't know if it's just the voice actors getting back to Hercules, like we already mentioned very early on about James Wood. It's just the, the oh. passion and how the animation is matching the passion of the voice acting. Everyone's going full tilt in it. It's absolutely it's, incredible. It, it's just like James Woods when he auditioned for it. He, you, you just know that everyone else would have been like this grandiose kind of Shakespearean performance of like, I am Hades, you know, yeah. that kind of, they would have had that kind of gravitas, like, uh, you know, like, uh, like how Char Charlton Heston, he, how he did the prologue. Yeah. Ago. That, that, that's how they would have done it. But he went in, he was like, no, I'm going to be a sleazy car salesman. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, what, that's the angle I want to go for. And they loved it. And they ate it up and like his improv as well. Like so many, yeah. so many of his, his lines that he uh, end, end up in the film are from him, you know, that's amazing. it's great. I just, yeah. that, just that freedom. And this is another thing that I, I think, I don't know if you agree with this as well, but these ones you've chosen, I, I know Michael J. Fox come up with a lot of stuff in back to the future as well. Robin Williams is Robin Williams. He's a force of nature, but just having maybe that freedom of play, in such big budget yeah. films or just such big films, but that does come across to the audience that, oh, these these performers are enjoying themselves. They're having fun. It yeah. doesn't just feel like a box to be ticked. We're actually, yeah. and you know, it comes through the voice acting as well. Oh, this is cool. Anything could happen. I'm enjoying this. Yeah, like uh, Rip Torn playing Zeus. You know? Oh, He's amazing. The same guy from, from Dodgeball. Right? <laughs> you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Like that guy, you know, he's, he's great and like a, a great wild choice for Zeus as well. Like he obviously has that gravitas, that deep bass to his voice, but he's a bit silly, you know, like a bit yeah. goofy with it. Like it's it's great choices. Um, yeah, it, it's it's amazing. Um, so what? And also, sorry, gun. Go, 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 no, 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 no please. And oh, no, I was going to say, uh, so gun. <laughs> you go. I'm stopping. There's a slight delay. You go. <laughs> Um, and with, with the art style as well, um, this is actually something I, I, I was doing a bit of research on, on uh, Hercules before jumping onto this. And what I found was fascinating. Um, I love the art style. Mm. It's, it seems so, so far apart from the, the Disney style of what you yes. found in, in Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And I, I found that the, the, the production designer was a guy called Gerald Scarf, who's a British guy, and he's uh, an illustrator for the New York Times, or the, the, oh. sorry, the, the New Yorker and things like that. And he was a, he's a political cartoonist. And he's got a very, very kind of like sharp and rough, like kind of like crazy style. And he had incredible pieces of art that he would send over and, you know, bring to Disney and basically oversee everything all of the art style so everything all the choices that you see in hercules are from this guy gerald scarf like the the the, the fire in in the hair yeah for hades that was him you know like how the hydra looks 
how the Hydra looks with its like you know snake like face, kind of a monkey style face, and that's that's him again. And his his overall influence changed how you know how that worked. And I felt like it was so perfect. You know, it just complemented it just complemented it along with the music as well. So like you have this very kind of like the bizarre stylized cartoon style which kind of like fit perfectly with the Greek, Greek myth look, I felt. And then you have gospel, and you just kind of mash it all together, and you've got a Greek story, gospel choir, and you've got this crazy art style with Gerald's scarf. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's incredible. And obviously, uh, you know, Alan Menken, who was the composer, um, we were bringing out these incredible, like, timeless songs, you know, like, oh, Go the Distance, Go the Distance. That got like, me pumped up. That made me want to go to the gym. I was like, yeah. these songs are like, <laughs> they're on, they're on fire, you know, like absolutely yeah. incredible. And like you say, timeless. Yeah, and Dan in the veto as well, like absolutely killing. So you wanna be a hero, kid? Well, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Just inc- like great stuff. And like I've, I've actually seen reviews where they've panned Danny the veto singing, and I'm like, oh. are you kidding me? fantastic character acting that's incredible you know like it's so fitting you know I, I, unreal i love do you, it do you, do you feel that sometimes though, when things get panned because it's it's they're daring to take risks and it's not always going to be the obvious choice it's not always maybe going to be i don't know singing for instance oh what what singing should sound like but then because it is so different it stands the test of time and having Again, this can be a thing about like these films you've chosen as well, particularly what we said about Back to the Future and having a script like that. Also as well, the choices in Hook and building it all practically, but going against the grain, doing something that isn't what's expected, but then yeah. at the time it might not be understood. But then it's, it's weird how so many classic iconic films at time of their release absolutely bomb or underwhelm. And then it's only for years after suddenly people go, that's incredible. Exactly. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think as well. Like a, a lot of what uh, what people didn't enjoy about Hercules was how little it had to do with the actual Heracles myth. Mm. You know, <laughs> the storyline had very little to do. And it's like, like some. I, I'm actually very much into my my Greek mythology these yeah. days. Um, and that's something that I, I, I again, I want to kind of touch back to um, seeing it now in an adult's eyes versus how I saw it as a kid. I had no idea about, you know, Greek mythology as a child. We vaguely went through Roman studies when I was like in year six, I guess, but that was all we kind of touched on. Um, but as like a, a hobby of myself, I, I love to, you know, look up uh, Greek mythology. I love to read books on it. And um, mm. that's a nice pastime of mine. And it has nothing to do with the Heracles myth, you know, <laughs> Hercules is a Roman way of saying Heracles. Heracles in the Greek myth is, is, is called Heracles. And, uh, you know, for example, um, Megara, who, you know, Meg, yeah. that was Hercules's wife. Mm. They had children. And then uh, Hera, who was Zeus's wife, uh, this, is the, this is the Greek myth, um, she was jealous of Hercules being alive because Zeus was cheating on Yeah, her. exactly. <laughs> and so she made he made Heracles' life absolute hell. She made him go into a, a crazy frenzy and he killed Meg and his two kids and he was like distraught with grief and he went to like, you know, console and make amends and he uh, he asked what he needed to do to, you know, um make it all better and he had to go through the 10 labors which ended up being the 12 labors and a little bit little snippets here and there you see that in the film but it's not the main storyline um and i think people will see that and and be like oh well this isn't a story about heracles at all this is just a disney ridiculousness you know like making you know making it all you know airy fairy and like you know nothing true to life but at the end of the day People like that who are naysayers kind of like neglect what uh, a Greek myth really is. It's not, sure. it's not set in stone. It's not uh, something that is written down. It's it's uh, something that's passed on and changed. And you know, people have many many different variations of the same story. And it's 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 not Greek myth in my eyes is is more of like cautionary tales. It's more about yes. how to how to build character in yourself and how to be uh, a better person. And it's a cautionary tales most of the time. 
Um, and Hercules does that for me because I feel like he was a great character, you know, yes. a great uh, role model to look for uh, as, as a kid, and you know. So I think with the redemptive arc and everything as well. But I mean, yeah, say, so you're saying watching it as an adult, um, how did it sort of chime in with you differently and stuff as well? Was that, I mean, obviously the change in mythology, I don't know how Disney would have ever got across Zeus going having an affair. <laughs> that would have been an interesting one. <laughs> but um, yeah, but yeah, how, how would it, um, how would it, yeah, how did it sort of like change with you now? I mean, as an initial choice and in watching it these days? I don't think it, change at all for me because it's so I, I just see it as two different entities mm. I see it as a, 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 you know maybe as an alternate universe Hercules you know and it doesn't it doesn't spoil the story for me at all it I I find it so endearing watching it and I just ha all I have is good feelings towards it and this uh this warmth when I watch it you know like and it's one of those things I'll never get tired I'll never get tired of watching yeah film, you know? And you and you the like it's interesting as well when a piece of art is so not nostalgic but just so um affectionate and so like neat so like real for you that mm. you can keep going back to it and your interpretation of it like you mentioned reading books when I reread a book you're coming at it a different person you're at a different time and a different person so you'll maybe get a different message from it it's still as important it's just the, yeah. your your translation of it because what your human experience is now changes somewhat and that that's a lovely piece about timeless art as well and important films in your life yeah yeah exactly I, I would agree with that for sure yeah so uh, uh, sorry go, on. go ahead no, no, so I was going to say, so these films to you now, with, with the look and you being such a physical actor and stuff as well, would you say, because obviously there's no getting away from it with Hercules especially, that he is such a physical character, would you say that had a, a young effect, a, an effect on young James at all? <laughs> of course it did. Yeah. yeah like you, you emulate, you know, you want to be these characters when you're yeah. a kid, you know, like, I want to be big and strong like Hercules, you know. And actually, funny enough, like, uh, when I was re-watching it today, I just remember when I was a kid feeling like I looked so much like young, skinny, scrawny Hercules with two two big hands. Like, I hadn't grown into my hands and feet yet. Like, I, I had, like, size 13 feet when I was only, like, 5 foot 9, 5 foot 10. And and then I was like, I'm never going to grow into myself. Like, I'm always going to be this, like, weird, sloppy-looking guy with big ears, big nose. And then, you know, like a couple of years later, you kind of grow into yourself and, and uh, you kind of resemble like the, the older version of Hercules. Not quite as not quite as big as that, obviously, but, um, you know, you, you can kind of like look back kind of joyously knowing that actually it turned out OK. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like when I see uh, young children, like six to eight year olds, and they've got massive wrist circumferences and you can already see they've got the development of traps. Yeah. Even though they've never done anything to hurt their shoulders, like oh, give that about five years. There's going to be lots of fun happening in your life when you yeah. like you, just, you yeah. can just see that it's all like genetically cocked to go. Like, everything's just going to kick well, in. That's just it. My, I've I've got a I've got a nephew who's about five years old, and he's just started um, playing rugby. Yes, and <clears throat> he. Um, He's half Wilkinson, so half like, you know, six foot five, 107 kilograms when he was an adult. And he's uh, on his dad's side, he's he's half Samoan. Oh so, my God. <laughs> so he's, and he's, he, he's, I, you know, he's, he's my, my nephew, so like I'm yeah. going to be acting favorably on him, but he is gifted. Like he's got like yeah. such great hand eye coordination, great ball control, very speedy, very athletic loves to jump and loves like has this amazing energy and if it can be channeled and directed in a certain way yes. you know like you, you can never tell a kid you have to do this because they won't want to do it but if he wants to do something you, yes. you, you just know this kid and he's got like crazy muscle development for for his age as well you know he's got like a little six-pack going on and he's got these like crazy like deltoids um yeah and he's got this like crazy long hair as well because uh, in the Samoan culture you don't cut your hair that's until it, yeah. I think it's ten years old or whatever, but uh, yeah, he's got really long hair and he's he's just a little wild wild child, you know. And he's gonna, I can I can see that happening for him, you know. It's just it's yeah. just amazing, like when you have that adolescent passion and you've got that perfect like unused body, and then you say you've got the genetic gifts with it as well. That's 
that's when you get the scary athletes. That's when they're, they're literally unstoppable yeah. because sometimes people who are naturally gifted don't appreciate it. But when they have the passion and they want to train in it, that's when you get the 1% of the 1%. And it's just like, oh, my word, nothing's going to stop you at all. Yeah. Well, if his dad has anything to do with it, he's definitely going to be playing for rugby for New Zealand, that's for sure. God, he sounds, gonna be, yeah. it sounds like he's going to be master of the universe. I, I one will get my uh, bow install ready to him to be quite. Sounds like the next rock coming on there or Roman Reigns or something like that. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. Terrible. Yeah. Well, no, listen, thank, listen, James, these have been an absolutely three amazing choices. Um, to be honest, going back for him as well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I like it. I mean, there's so much good current cinema as well especially in the independent scene but when someone says to me let's watch some older films it's just you get that hit of nostalgia but also you sometimes get a nice little recollection of just how good older cinema is and you you forget about it because it's just so good you almost take it for granted but then you watch it again and you're oh this just a, a film told in a shorter time just gets everything across and has a style and a vision that's so complete. Like you say, again, going back to that analogy of chipping away at a bit of stone, you can feel there's no, there's nothing wasted. Everything's sufficient. Everything has a purpose. And in these three films, I think you've just hit across three absolute classics. And to anyone who's watching this or listening to this hook back to the future, Hercules, do yourself a favor, get them watched if you haven't, because they're absolutely incredible. Exactly so, what you said. <laughs> <laughs> and silence. But uh and sing. But um no, but listen, before we go, I would yeah, thanks once again. Is there anywhere where people can follow you? Um apart from coming to Singapore and seeing an excellent show by the sounds of it. And um I'll put it in the show notes as well. Yeah, great. Uh you can follow me on uh Instagram. It's James Wilkinson Official. Amazing. Right. That, that's all that's always seems to be a good one. Until Fred's becomes a massive thing, I think Instagram is gonna be the way everyone goes at the moment. But um no, thank you so much once again, mate. It's it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for making this time for me. And um yeah, I will uh, speak to you soon. All right, mate. Cheers, man. Thanks for thanks. thanks for the invite. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been awesome. All the best, mate. Take care.